When it comes to action and challenge, few jobs are as demanding or intense as being a U.S. Navy SEAL. The workplace, on the move. A phone call can send a SEAL team anywhere in the world on short notice. Work hours, mostly night. The SEALs use darkness as cover and most often want to stay out of sight. So they work in teams as small as 2, 4, 8, or 16. They're almost always outnumbered. But on their side is speed, stealth, and surprise. They're trained to arrive and leave quickly and quietly, operating by sea, air, and land. That's why they're called SEALs. Job duties? They're likely to be among the first Americans sent into a hot zone. Sometimes they stay out of sight just to see what's going on and report back. Other times they might strike in a lightning-fast raid, rescuing hostages or stopping terrorists. While no experience is necessary to join, being physically fit and comfortable in the water is an advantage. Once in the program, candidates get some of the most comprehensive military training in the world. I felt I was a very normal kind of uh, uh, teenager and I really wanted to step it up a little bit and do something extraordinary. After going through college, looking at all the options that I had, um, looking, trying a job in the business world, I had a very good job and I enjoyed it, but I didn't feel like I was really doing anything worthwhile. I didn't feel like I was making a difference. What makes this a unique job? That's what the next 20 minutes are all about. You're gonna see what it's like to be a U.S. Navy SEAL. The career of a SEAL starts here, at the Naval Special Warfare Center just outside San Diego. It's the home of BUDS, or Basic Underwater Demolition SEALs Training. This little piece of lettuce in a real life situation can give you away. BUDS lasts six months. It's been called the most physically demanding training in the military. Candidates need to pass a tough physical fitness test just to make it here. Then the first few weeks of BUDS prepares them for their first big challenge, Hell Week. In five and a half days, they'll get no more than four hours total of sleep. Around the clock, the class faces challenges that simulate the difficulty and intensity of actual SEAL missions, including running one of the toughest obstacle courses in the military, and having to land rubber boats at night in high surf against unforgiving rocks. The training is made even more challenging due to sleeplessness, exhaustion, cold temperatures, and often a range of potential injuries. Doctors check each student twice a day to be sure they're fit to continue. Any significant injury, and the student is pulled out of Hell Week. Buzz is terrifying. It's gratifying. Cold, wet, miserable. What you go through every day challenges you more than you've ever been challenged in your whole life. I'm going to thank my instructors for being able to push me past my limits. What your body can accomplish is really far more than what you previously had thought. There's nothing you can't do. And then not being able to sleep and just, you know, falling asleep standing up. During Hell Week, I found I could fall asleep while I was underneath the boat while running. Not every student can push himself hard enough to succeed. In fact, two out of three students quit during this six-month BUDS course by ringing this bell. Their helmets stay behind as a reminder to their classmates. What drives the students who do make it? We're in a surf zone rolling around, it's freezing cold. Guys are laughing, making jokes, singing songs. And uh, I think you have to have that kind of sick, twisted sense of humor to make it through buds. The worse it gets, the more funny it is. The guys here are some of the best guys in the world, I think. You cannot make it through this place by yourself. To have those guys there beside you, helping you, encouraging you, when three days into Hell Week with no sleep, you are at your absolute low, and the guy next to you says, come on, we can make it one more hour, and the next day you're saying the same thing to him, is what makes it possible, and is what makes them the best friends you're gonna find. You don't get through buds as an individual. You get the bud through buds as part of a team. But who ends up on that team is difficult to predict. 
Some of the most accomplished athletes drop out, and the least athletic candidates, if they have the SEAL never quit attitude, come through. There have been over 12,000 people who have done this in the past and have completed this training successfully. It is not out of reach of anyone who is in good health and who is physically fit to get through this training. The training is 90% mental and 10% physical. So in order to prepare yourself physically and mentally to come into BUDS, we actually have a website. And it would be good if any prospective candidate could get on that website and see the type of workouts that we ask them to do and to follow them to the letter of the law. Most of the time, the reason that a guy washes out of training is that he has not followed that <laughs> regimen. I will have guys who will come in and proudly proclaim that they've been running 10 miles a week when you go into first phase and you'll be running 10 miles a day. And it only gets tougher from there. You really have to want this to become a SEAL. The program is not set up for failure. The program is set up for success. They take you from being a kid that can't swim, teach you how to swim. Take a kid that doesn't have any running ability, and you can run. I tried the program, and I've done the program, and I completed the program, and I am who I am today because of that. Hell Week is just one part of becoming a SEAL. During BUDS, candidates also learn the skills of the trade, like combat diving, weapons and demolition use, navigation, small boat handling, clandestine reconnaissance, and escape and evasion. I'm getting paid to be here, to be working out on the beach, to be running, to be swimming, to be learning how to dive, being taught how to shoot. I mean, this is stuff that other people would pay to do, and I'm getting taught to do it by men who are very experienced in what they do. I mean, you can't really ask for a better job description so far. You're off someplace else, and it's not going to work. Buds is long and hard, but when SEALs come back from missions, they fully respect the hard training they endured. Well, the reason training is so vital is because when your adrenaline's pumping and you're full steam ahead, you rely on muscle memory because everything becomes cloudy. Things slow down, decisions you make might be altered by your adrenaline, so you totally rely on that muscle memory. Repetition, repetition. What is all of the intensive Buds training for? What is the purpose of the U.S. Navy SEALs? That's best answered with a quick look at some of the challenges they've faced in the past. The need for commandos like the SEALs began in World War II. Before Allied forces could hit the beach, swimmers had to scout approaches and clear obstacles that might stop landing craft. They were eventually formed into underwater demolition teams, or the UDTs. In 1962, President John F. Kennedy directed the Navy to develop a special force for unconventional warfare. In response, the Navy developed the SEAL teams and recruited many UDT members into them. The SEALs were quickly pulled into the Vietnam conflict. The enemy, the Viet Cong, would call us the men with green faces because we snuck in, usually at late at night, and were out before the morning, and uh, were kind of a mystifying force to them. We would abduct key enemy personnel for interrogation to gather intelligence. We came in and left silently, quickly, so they were deathly afraid of us. The SEALs became one of the most decorated combat units in Vietnam. One reason why is men like Mike Thornton. Petty Officer Thornton and his teammate, Lieutenant Tom Norris, were inserted into enemy territory from the water. They ran into an intense firefight with North Vietnamese regulars and got separated. When Thornton asked the South Vietnamese fighting alongside him where Norris was, they told him, shot dead. Thornton said, we're not leaving him. And Mike, by himself, went back in several hundred yards, found Tom Norris, who was gravely wounded, just barely conscious, killed several North Vietnamese that were right with Tom Norris at the time, threw some grenades, did some firing, opened up a hole, grabbed Tom Norris, threw him over his shoulder and ran back to the beach through a hail of gunfire, took him through the surf zone and swam him out to sea where a boat rescued them. Mike very easily could have said, well, I guess he's dead and it's too dangerous to go back and get him. That's the mindset of our community. It doesn't make any difference what the risks are. The teammate needs help, you go help him. For saving Tom Norris's life, Petty Officer Mike Thornton received the Congressional Medal of Honor and carried out a SEAL tradition that continues to this day. No SEAL has ever left a teammate behind on a mission, alive, wounded, or dead.
SEAL teamwork was tested again on the Caribbean island of Grenada in 1983. They were part of a fast raid to stop a growing Cuban military threat. Commander Donald K. Erskine led a team of 12 SEALs, half of whom he hadn't worked with closely before, on a mission to take over a radio station. Intelligence had reported that it was lightly defended. The SEALs took the radio station, but were quickly surrounded by more than 100 enemy troops and an armored personnel carrier that was blasting them with a 20-millimeter cannon. To make matters worse, when they tried to call for support, they found that radio frequencies back to U.S. headquarters had been switched without their knowledge. The building was flying apart. Bullets were coming through the walls like paper. We had to do the escape and evasion out to the sea. To do that, we had to fight our way through the field, through a crossfire, surrounded on three sides. I remember becoming very calm as I took my helmet out the door because I was sure that I was going to die right there. And all I could do was get my guys through the field as best I could. We fought our way in a leapfrog fashion down the field uh, through a hail of bullets. The leapfrog tactic is a basic tactic that you learn in BUDS training. Even though I hadn't worked with half of the members of my element, that tactic every frogman knows. And because of that, we were able to move down the field. That's the thing about SEAL training. You can always count on your troops. When the bullet hit me, I'm over 200 pounds. It picked me up off my feet. I thought I'd lost my entire arm. With his right elbow severely injured, Erskine led his team through a barbed wire fence and thick jungle to a cave overlooking the sea. Waiting for darkness, they had to lay low and avoid both enemy scouts walking inches over their heads and American gunships blasting their position, thinking they were dead. At 3 a.m., they swam out to sea, where five hours later they were pulled from the water by a Navy ship. On board, after being awake for 48 hours straight, Commander Erskine accounted for all of his men before passing out from the pain of his injury. We'd have fought to the last man to protect each other. That is something that is a quality that you come to buds with, but it's also built upon because of the nature of the training and the bond that's formed. Today, the SEALs could be sent anywhere in the world on short notice. A new generation is fighting a new war. After September 11th is when everything came to realization, like, this is it, this is the deal, and we are ready. Right before we got on the plane to go into Afghanistan, the general in charge of special operations came up and gave us a speech, and he's like, you know, you can do your busy work all day long, and you could tie your shoelaces a million times, and check your knife and sharpen your knife a hundred times, but at some point in the day, you're going to have to make peace with yourself. And that kept on running through my mind as we were flying into Afghanistan. Yeah, I was nervous and definitely stopped to make peace with myself. The SEALs, some of whom were in high school just a few years earlier, were among the first U.S. troops sent into Afghanistan. Shortly after September 11th, a SEAL platoon was ordered to scout the area that would eventually become known as Camp Rhino. When we first got there, it was freezing. I had this problem with my goggles. They kept fogging up and I was a driver. So I kept on having to stop and clean my goggles out. As we were moving, my biggest fear wasn't coming into contact. I'd say it was more driving through minefields. Desert patrol vehicles like these were one of the tools available to the SEALs in Afghanistan. I didn't sleep for about four or five days out there. I was up the entire time. And you go through your rotation, you do your job, and then you could sleep. I don't think one guy slept the entire time out there. Now that's over, I really want to go back over. I'd do it again in a heartbeat, because it's our job. What makes the SEALs so effective? One advantage is that SEAL teams can get to their objective and leave with speed and stealth. From the sea, they ride in small craft driven by Special Warfare Combatant Craft Crewmen, or SWICs. Being a SWIC is a separate job from being a SEAL. It has its own demanding but shorter training program. If you want a challenge in your life and you want to be able to go 50 knots on the water in the middle of the night, then this is the course for you. When we start our jobs, most people are coming home from work and we're launching our boats. When they're getting up in the morning, we're coming in from a mission. It's a lot of fun, just a great place to be. One of the boats the Swix pilot for SEAL missions is the Mark V Special Operations Craft. It can carry as many as 16 commandos up to 600 miles. Two virtually silent water jet engines blasted ahead at more than 50 knots. 
If the boat runs into enemy fire, the driver can use the joystick like a fighter pilot to fly it back and forth in an evasive maneuver called yanking and banking. The Mark V also has a sloped rear deck so that it can deploy and retrieve a combat rubber raiding craft without stopping. CRRCs, as they're called, are designed to take a team of SEALs from out of sight over the horizon through the surf for a clandestine landing. Or the SEALs might approach underwater using special closed circuit scuba gear that doesn't release telltale bubbles to the surface. I dug the night diving when uh, I realized you could pop your head up quietly and nobody sees you, and nobody knows what's going on, and you're just 20 feet underwater and it's just pitch black and all you can see is your compass board. I just, I kind of, it's a nice little mini adrenaline rush. Another way to travel underwater is aboard a sealed delivery vehicle, launched and recovered from a dry deck shelter mounted on a U.S. Navy submarine. From the air, SEALs can ride to a mission in a variety of aircraft. One of these is the $40 million Pave Low helicopter. It can fly in the dark as fast as 150 miles per hour, just 100 feet off the ground. If detected, its guns can lay down 4,000 rounds per minute over an area the size of a football field. A technique called fast roping can put a team of SEALs on the ground in seconds. and a spy rig, short for special purpose insertion and extraction, can get them out fast. From an airplane, the SEALs might perform a nighttime halo, or high altitude, low opening jump. They exit the plane as high as 30,000 feet, then deploy their main chute as low as 3,000 feet to avoid detection. Biggest adrenaline rushes are definitely your air operations, free fall jumps. You're usually carrying 60 to 80 pounds of gear on your body and that makes you very unstable. You're always constantly rehearsing in your head what you're gonna do as you exit the bird. You get your call to go, you do your proper exit, you just see the earth screaming at you at 130 miles an hour. On land, the SEALs use a number of techniques for staying out of sight. One of the most sought after jobs is to be on a two-man sniper team you're sent deep into hostile territory to gather information or strike at the enemy's weakest point. Trained to stay hidden for long periods of time, it might take a sniper team as long as 12 hours to move 500 feet. The SEAL sniper rifle can hit a target from three quarters of a mile away and deliver a bullet big enough to disable a truck or Jeep engine. Another area of SEAL expertise is close quarters combat, which is often needed for counter-terrorist or hostage rescue missions. The SEALs train to move in a line, leapfrogging around their teammates to cover all angles, communicating silently by touch and hand signals. But tools and technology aren't the SEAL team's real strength. Naval Special Warfare relies, above all else, on what instructors call the Mark I Mod O SEAL, a naval commando hardened by some of the most difficult military training in the world. The SEALs are confident, and they're cocky, and they're very, very good at what they do. And I would say to tell a SEAL he'll fail, a SEAL won't believe you, because he won't go out unless he knows he has a chance of success, and he always goes out. For more information about naval special warfare operators like the SEALs or SWICs, or to see what it takes to join these programs, check out these websites.